I think we've got most folks in. You know, maybe we should have called for rain tonight. Last, the last time there were like 600 people here and we were like blown away and we thought, oh, pretty weather. We'll have a thousand. But anyway, we're spread out. So I'm happy you're here. Good evening and welcome to the second community conversation on poverty to progress. The vice mayor and I are so pleased to see all of you here tonight. Your presence shows that you are committed to reducing poverty in our community and dedicated to making Lynchburg a great place to live, work, and play for everyone. I'm going to switch gears for a minute. Recently, we lost two longtime residents who worked diligently to make this a better community, and they were at our first meeting. They have both been eulogized, and much has been written about their philanthropic endeavors, so I won't prolong that tonight by repeating it. But I think it is entirely appropriate for us to pause for just a moment of silence and remembrance of these two lovely ladies, Lynn Dodge and Roselle Shul, for their love of this community and for all that they have accomplished in their lifetime to, in service to others. You know what, though? If they were still here with us, I know they would also ask that we remember the victims of the horrific shooting in Las Vegas. So please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to welcome um, the Vice Mayor up to the podium and um, Vice Mayor Trinae Tweedy. You don't need that. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, welcome, everyone. I have the pleasure of introducing our fellow members of City Council who are with us tonight. Uh, we have Councilman Sterling Wilder, and I'll ask you to stand, please. Councilmember Mary Jane Dolan. Councilmember Jeff Hegelson, Councilmember Randy Nelson, and our other Councilmember Turner Perro was unable to attend tonight due to a conflict, um, but he sends his best. And also, I believe we have, thank you all for being here. You can have a seat. Thank you. And I believe, did I see Delegate Scott Garrett come in? Thank you for being here, Delegate Garrett. We're also happy to have Bonnie Severchek, our city manager, Charles Hartgrove, our deputy city manager, John Hughes IV, who has, must, I must say, been in the trenches working with the Poverty to Progress Initiative, and Dr. Larry Massey, our interim superintendent for Lynchburg City Schools. I do see, or did see, the chairman of the school board, Dr. Nellis, here. Are there any other members of the school board here tonight? Dr. Coleman is here. Thank you, our chair and vice chair are here. Is there anyone else? Thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> On stage with us are some of the work group facilitators who have been meeting throughout the summer months, and you will meet them in just a little bit later. However, for now, anyone here tonight who has been meeting with one of the nine groups, could you also please stand for we would like to recognize you. So if you have been working over the summer meeting with any of the nine groups that are subcommittees of From Poverty to Progress, would you please stand? All right, thank you. We want to thank you so much for the work you're doing to make a difference in our community. Lastly, our thanks are to the organizations that are at our resource tables tonight out in the lobby we invited several of our workforce development, our training and education programs available to our residents in the city of Lynchburg, Beacon of Hope, Bridges of Central Virginia, and I would like to say that if you know folks, if you are here or you know people who would like to register for getting ahead classes, they can do that at the Bridges table. Central Virginia Community College Workforce Solutions, Goodwill Industries of the Valleys, Old Dominion Job Corps, Lynchburg City Schools Career Tech Program, 
Lynchburg Community Action Group, Tech Hire, which is a uh, program of the Lynchburg Office of Economic Development, Region 2000 Workforce Development Center. Why are they here? If you know people who are unemployed, underemployed, need additional skills, training and education, the experts are in the lobby. The ones who are connected, who provide job training, career readiness, credentialing, training programs, that's who you need to send them to. Word of mouth, take information to people you know, but they are out there to serve as a resource tonight. If you haven't had the opportunity to visit them, I encourage you to stop by there on your way out. They have valuable information to share. The purpose of tonight's conversation is to report out to the greater community the progress that has been made to date on the Poverty to Progress initiative. As you have seen, there are lots of people working to find actionable solutions to reduce the rate of poverty in this community. We want to make it clear that this has been and will continue to be a difficult journey. There are no easy, fix there are no easy fixes to systemic poverty. With that said, the mayor and I are proud of the progress so far, and it is exciting to see a community galvanized to find real, sustainable solutions. If there was an easy fix to this, someone would have found it across the country and around the world. We've got to work hard, and that's what we're trying to do. I'm going to invite the mayor back up. Janae and I are going to pitch it because we're, we're a team in this effort, and we want to show that tonight. Right now, though, it's important to remember that when we talk about poverty, we're also talking about economic development and the financial well-being of all of our citizens. When people are able to move out of poverty, work in a job that pays a living wage, and are able to enjoy what most of us take for granted, the entire community becomes stronger. In an op-ed piece recently that I read, I'm going to share it with you. The writer paraphrased President, President John F. Kennedy's remarks about economic development. Here's what he said. President Kennedy said that a rising tide lifts all boats. However, the writer continued by saying that while Kennedy was, of course, right, he missed a really important point. A rising tide only lifts all boats when everyone has a boat. So, your work with Poverty to Progress is going to help make sure that people have that boat, and when one rises, we all rise. And when we all rise, the city will be stronger, more vibrant community for all of our citizens. We want to take a few minutes, though, because I've had feedback. Well, when did you start this? What are you all doing as a city? Well, we want to show you and retrace the journey that Poverty to Progress has taken and explain how we have gotten to where we are tonight. And when I say we, Lynchburg City Council, and we're, we're here in, in, in all of us in spirit tonight, but I want you to see some of the journey. And I'm going to ask the Vice Mayor to come back up because we're going to kind of team, tag team this. I'm going to move over. <laughs> My stool. Stool with you. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. Well, it was in September, and we'll have it on the screen, that City Council initiated the discussion on poverty. We kept hearing it, and actually I would heard it in the last election um, four years ago, and I was thinking, okay, we have a problem, poverty problem, and I kept hearing it's growing. And then in December, the city held the Bridges Out of Poverty Awareness Training, um, which had over 400 attendees there to learn about the Bridges Out of Poverty process. And then City Council decided, okay, we're going to get an accurate number. We were hearing all these numbers thrown out at us about our poverty rate. So we, City Council, put some funding down and brought in the Weldon Cooper folks from Charlottesville to measure our poverty problem. 
And in what we found, yes, we do have a problem. We found <clears throat> that we have 24.6% poverty rate that's generational poverty, not situational, not if you just lose your job and are looking for a job, but this is generational. That's about a quarter of our population. And what we found out, that was very disturbing, 30% of those are children. And so in that following May, as we're going through the budget discussion, City Manager Kimball Payne continued this poverty discussion with City Council and threw those facts at us. And really, it was then that we did notice, yes, we've got to do something and make some sort of uh, commitment to this. And then in November of 2016, a conceptual approach was introduced to City Council. And this was the culmination of several meetings. Um, the mayor, uh, myself, and the city manager committed that every meeting we had in our bi-weekly meetings, poverty was going to be a topic of discussion to try to find some type of approach for our city. And so that conceptual approach was introduced to city council, which has brought us here to this point. And at that point, uh, initial funding had been uh, allocated to do some of the bridges training. And in December of 2016, the um, city manager appointed an assistant city manager, John Hughes IV, to work 50% of his time on being that glue that kind of brings this together, whatever that together would be, because we weren't quite sure yet. In February of this year, we at the State of the City gave a call to action to the community, and that's when the concept was introduced, as well as just having everyone to understand that we have to work on this together as a whole, collectively. And we had the May 4th meeting here in this auditorium where 600 plus people turned out in the pouring rain. And here was the important piece. We have over 600, it's heading towards 70 or 80, letters of commitment from private citizens who said, I'm in, I'm in with you, city government. I'm gonna help you because we had to turn to our community. Government can't offer all the solutions. So over 670 individuals have signed on or become a part of one of these nine committees. And over the summer, the nine work groups, those on the stage and those who stood up and others who could not be here, uh, met. We kind of tasked them with meeting at least up to two times over the summer um, with the goal of creating actionable items to begin to work on. They did that. Um, we've had several facilitator meetings and so after the May meeting they took the ideas that came forth in the May meeting with those 600 or so here. Mm -hmm. We broke out into groups and they took all of the thoughts and suggestions and ideas and they kind of whittled them down um, to see what could be um, actionable items and things we could move forward on. Meanwhile, John, myself, Trené, and a number of our facilitators began meeting in the community, talking to community organizations. Many are doing this work. So we wanted to know how can we collectively come together and do this work together. We talked to houses of worship, business leaders, um, organizations, nonprofit, um, and gleaned more information about what is presently being done. And we also received during this time a community wealth building grant um, to work with um, the poverty initiative, to work with uh, the plans that will come forward. Um, it is through the Department of Social Services mm -hmm. and the state community wealth building um, project that's being implemented in, in, in several localities. So we were received an award. Um, I think, yeah, 100,000 for tech hire. Uh, and go visit that table, because you'll see they're doing some wonderful things and employing folks, and also continuing some of the work that the Bridges Out of Poverty, because we need to identify those 50 individuals, and we've heard, had questions about that, and we hope we cover that tonight. And now, presently, we are engaged in applying for a huge grant that former Mayor Bloomberg has initiated a, um, I guess a challenge to mayors across the U.S. Step up and do something really bold, an initiative that um, 
would change your community that could be replicable in other communities. So hey, we already started something here, right? So we signed on, we're interested. Well, guess what? We were out of the 500 and some communities, we were selected to have a workshop uh, where we could explore ideas there to apply for a grant. And here's what we're hoping that we'd send good thoughts up for, that we would be one of the 36 communities across America because our grant is, our idea is fabulous, and that we would have $100,000 to expand that grant. And eventually, if, that, if it's great enough, we could be awarded $5 million or a million. So we're going for gold. We're going for the five million because, you know, that's what it's going to take that plus a whole lot more to do some of the things we need to do. <coughs> and with these uh, grants, the one we're going for, the one we received, it does take out of the box thinking. And so this whole process, when you see some of the actionable items, you're going to say, oh, okay, you know, is that regular? Is that something that's been done before? We're coming together collectively in a way that I've not seen us come together, the mayor's not seen us come together, organizations throughout. And so a part of that is collaboration with the faith-based community. Um, let me just mention that we are asking that the faith community to join us in this effort. We have hundreds of houses of worship in Lynchburg, and you have many resources from meeting rooms to trained facilitators and so much more. There is a letter there's a letter for the faith community at the registration table in the lobby. And if you are interested, if you're a pastor, you're a minister, you're a lay leader, please take it back if your leadership is not present. Um, pick up the letter from the table in the lobby. And, and please, it gives you a, a listing of uh, po possible options on how you can assist and help with this effort. Um, and you may have some suggestions for us, but we really want you to be signed on as a faith community. Now that's a little bit about the path we have all been on thus far. When we look at this process, we think in terms of four major steps. Exploration, identification of action items, creation of action plans, and lastly, execution. Exploration. First we had to review the data. Then we had to have a call to action. That call to action helped to raise awareness throughout our community that a quarter of our population are living under impoverished guidelines. Then we had to engage the community. We had to get people to come out. We have to educate them. We have to get them to be a part of the process. There are so many more that are affected by this that they have to be told and, and, and have to be sure the information has to be shared with them. So we need you to be the folks that go out and do the sharing of information bring people to the table, bring them to the meetings, bring them to the resources that are available. And secondly, here we are. This is where we are tonight, the action items. We've had those facilitator meetings all summer long. They have whittled down all those ideas to two actionable goals, and that isn't just the facilitators, that's the committee of folks who joined and they themselves whittled it down. It was hard. It was a hard job. And hats off to you guys for doing a great facilitation. And then tonight, here we are. We're going to do the community update. And um, then the next step, Trinae? Are the creation of action plans. Um, one thing about this, we, how many of you have heard that it's always talk? It's always talk. Um, and so, yeah, people have their hands raised. It's always talk. Well, we committed to not just being talk, because to make systemic change, you have to address policies, you have to address processes, you have to address resources. And so that takes some action. So the facilitators, the groups were challenged to get their meeting done. How many of you have heard government moves slow? Well, we're trying to push the needle on that, okay? So just a little bit, right? But the creation of action plans to discuss the process and next steps, identify available resources. So after tonight, the facilitators and the groups, they are gonna come back to create those plans to identify some of the, some of the action steps you're gonna hear about are gonna take money. So where's that money gonna come from? Where are the partnerships and networks gonna come from? We have to discuss that. Next, 
What has been presented tonight, the actionable items, the work will be on the City Council retreat, November 7th, our annual retreat. And that's because as a council, council needs to um, learn more about what is being presented tonight, um, discuss the actionable items, discuss the work of the group, and have input into the process. That will occur on November 7th. Workshop for facilitators in the future is planned so that their action plans can be brought into fruition, if you will, with all of the components there. And then, last but definitely not least, after that plan is in place, we have that stamp of approval from um, City Council. We've heard the input. We've held that workshop. We begin the long journey. We begin to execute what we want to do to bring in to our to decrease our rate of poverty I guess we'll always have some poverty but we want our numbers down and then implementation of some of those plans they're pretty awesome wait till you hear them and then we've got to have some data we've got to have some quantifiable data that says we're here's where we know we are well we want to do this but then what, what difference has it made? We've got to measure that, folks, because that's the proof. And then eventually we would like a council board or commission to be formed that would carry this journey on. You know, it's, it, it took us a long time to get here. It's going to take us a long journey. So, you know, councils come and councils go, but maybe this board or commission will last and, and continue that journey. And then one day, and I hope it's not a dream, that we will have a thriving city. And after we see that difference has been made, I think we'll step back and assess the whole process about how did, how did we do? How did, how did this process, what, do we need to regroup? Do we need to come back and change some things? So to reiterate, we'll go to the next slide. <clears throat> The primary goal, the City Council approved in November 10, almost a year ago, 2016, was to move to facilitate the moving of 50 willing, able, hopeful, and motivated households out of poverty annually for the next five years. So from 2018 to 2022 is the period we're looking at secondary goal to this is to decrease the poverty rate in Lynchburg and to raise to raise the medium income ultimately that will have a poverty rate that's less than the national and the state average it's a lofty goal we can do it folks and additional goals then is that there will be a city commission or a board or whatever we call it formed and that we will maintain a a web portal that will hold all this information about the needs and the resources that are available in our community because we've come together collectively and, and we have come up with here's, here are the resources, here are the needs, here's how we access them. So hopefully the ultimate goal is that we'll be a thriving community <clears throat> but we will be assessing our progress along the way. We can't just have a warm fuzzy. We've got to have some uh, quantitative data that shows we're being successful. And we believe that these steps will move us closer to having an impact on poverty in Lynchburg. And we need you to come along on this journey. If you're not signed up, we're really hoping you will. So, Trené? I think we can all agree that a quality education for everyone from kindergarten to beyond is a critical piece of the puzzle in combating poverty. That's why I am very happy to welcome the interim superintendent, Dr. Larry Massey, to the podium tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trené, and thank you sincerely for the opportunity to speak tonight at the Poverty to Progress meeting. And also, thank you sincerely for the suggestions that have been made by the Education Committee for consideration by the Lynchburg City School Board. We salute the work of Dr. Roger Jones and Lynchburg Together, a community group formed to support our city schools, 
and Dr. Terry Brennan, who is emphasizing greater access to pre-kindergarten programs. Public education is a key to overcoming poverty in Lynchburg. Gainful employment is a, is a necessity for an individual to be able to break the bonds of poverty. Education provides the training which qualifies a person for a good job in the professions, the workforce, or the military. The lack of an adequate education for a person is a sentence to unemployment and dooms one to a dead-end life of poverty. Lynchburg City Schools is committed to providing an outstanding education to each student. The school system is also committed to significant and meaningful improvement and with the help of the many individuals here tonight who have demonstrated their support, that improvement will be achieved. You know, one aspect that's very important is the selection of a new superintendent. That is important to education in Lynchburg. And in that light, I want to announce that the Lynchburg City Schools is conducting another forum for citizens to provide input on the characteristics they want to see in the next school superintendent. And that forum will be here at E.C. Glass High School in the Marie Waller Lecture Hall next Wednesday, October the 11th at 6 o'clock to 7.30. I have flyers on the Lynchburg City Schools table out in the lobby. I hope you'll take one home and remember that date. We're going to be reminding you on radio and TV and by email and phone calls, so I hope we'll have a good crowd. And <clears throat> if you don't mind, please come out and show your interest in the selection of the next school superintendent, which I believe my contribution notwithstanding is very, very important uh, for the conducting of business of a school system. Um, I've gotten several recommendations already from, from folks as to what those characteristics should be. I have to share one with you I got today anonymously. They said they hoped the next superintendent had more hair and was slim, but uh, we'll see about that. But thank you so much for your interest in education. We appreciate it greatly. Good evening. You sure? <coughs> Hello, I'm John Hughes. I heard that. And I'm, I'm joined the mayor and the vice mayor, as well as all of our facilitators and everyone else here tonight, in welcoming you to the second meeting for From Poverty to Progress. At this time, we'll hear from our nine representatives from the work groups who will briefly share with you the actionable goals their groups have identified. After we hear from each group, we will briefly open up the floor for any questions you may have for any of the group representatives or for us. There are microphones here. The light, I can see a couple of them. I think there's two. Uh, please, we ask that you go to the microphone if you have any questions and be respectful of the time that we have. Um, ask a question and we'll have one of our panel members or some of our esteemed members of the audience who are much more intelligent than I answer those questions as well. First, we'll hear from the child care group represented here by Lisa Darby. Jane Grady, sorry. Jane Grady. I had Jane on my mind and Lisa on my words. So. I looked at the wrong way. I like borrow the store. Oh, no, I don't think I think I'm, I think I'm good. I think I'm okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, wanted to start out by saying that we on the child care committee think that child care is such a basic essential you just plain old can't work if you don't have child care and um, sometimes I will admit when we in the child care community are feeling a little underappreciated we like to think about what it would be like if we all shut down at the same time for a week to see how that would impact the community. And we know it would have a huge impact on the businesses, on the medical community, on the education community. Uh, Childcare is just really important. Um, what, the two goals that we set as a committee were um, to create a map. Is it up there? 
you know, to display the child care programs and locations that currently exist. And we've done that already. What we found out was um, there's a large shortage of child care, especially for infants and toddlers, and that there is also um, a shortage for certain groups who need to work nights and weekends, that, that there's very little for those um, employees too. So um, that's what the map helped us to know. We, we really need to work on it a little longer to determine, because there are, although there are child care centers all over the city, they, they work with different ages, different times of the day, different schedules. So um, the second goal is to reach out to employers to get them to give us some more specific information about the barriers that their specific employees have. So, for example, if you're an employer who, um, you're in retail and you're open till nine o'clock at night, do your employees all need childcare? That would be open till nine o'clock at night. So we want to look at the specific needs of different neighborhoods and, and businesses to um, find, be more specific with that. We've also found out through all these summer meetings that there's really a lot of crossover from one committee to another. Uh, and with the education committee, um, we really would love to collaborate with that committee because the uh, pre-K uh, education, they're trying to expand that. And so many of the child care centers in Lynchburg already have very high quality early childhood education programs as a component of it. And if you think about it, if you have children there all day long while their parents are working, what better place to provide an education for them at the same time. So we're hoping to be able to collaborate with the education um, committee also. So thank you. Thank you for that, Jane. You, you're, you all, all can also stay at the table if you like. Uh, you can, everyone else, you can stay at the table if you like to to uh, speak. Sorry I didn't get that to you, Jane. Um, next we'll have Ms. Laura Hamilton on, on education. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh. Um, I'm Laura Hamilton and um, a huge thanks goes out to Ken West, who was really our guide in this process. Thank you, Ken. And also to Pat Price. Pat, where? I know you're back there somewhere. There she is. And to Pat Price for her work on this committee. Another big thanks goes out to Roger Jones, who's instrumental in helping us, and Dr. Terry Brennan. So thank you to you all as well. Um, so you'll see some pretty meaty goals for the Education Committee. Um, I assure you those are pared down from where we started. Um, there were many, many, many diverse opinions that were in the room during the two education subcommittee meetings, the first August 10th, and the second was in September. Um, and lots of great voices kind of brought these two particular issues of focus to the table. Um, the first is really about um, utilizing this incredible community and all of its resources to create a village around our, all of our students, but particularly around our students who may have larger barriers to success. And this is through Dr. Jones's group, Lynchburg Together, which has been working for several months um, on some of the issues that we identified here. Um, the first is to use community resources and connect to those resources that are already out there to create alternatives to suspension for, stu for, for students in special cases. So rather than putting students into the cycle of suspension, it offers opportunities for mentoring, opportunities for work study as opposed to um, straight suspension and opportunities for our children to gr grow rather than to be punished. The second is to expand opportunities for Lynchburg's young people to be better connected to what our group has been calling a significant other. And so whether this is a mentor, whether this is a positive adult role model inside or outside the family, teachers, community folks, to help each student create a plan for success. 
So we know that each of our students should be considered individuals and each of them have individual challenges. And so as significant others, it will be our role to help guide them through that process. The third part of that goal is to ensure that families are a part of this process, not to take children out of their family village unit and provide an additional role model, but to incorporate this kind of learning and mentoring within the very fabric of the family so that we can make sure we wrap all of our students and meet the needs of those barriers that are gonna prevent them from being successful, their health needs, their social needs, all of those obstacles that, that many of us work on every day. The fourth component of um, wrapping our children is to utilize our community, our faith community, many of the resources that are already successfully working out there and help them to collaborate so that we can have an informed tutor and mentor program that works with our teachers and our faculty in Lynchburg City Schools to make sure that we're not just doing homework help, but we're helping our children catch up, stay on top, and move ahead. So, so that's, our, that's our wraparound. Our second goal, um, and this really does sort of echo the work that Jane's committee has been doing, um, is to improve kindergarten readiness by increasing access to pre-K services for our children across the city and promoting preschool literacy. So we recognize that it's not our role to go to the school board and say, hey, school board, you need to widen access to pre-K services because we recognize that that's just not a simple answer. But we know that in this community, there are many, many resources out there that can be connected to provide educational resources, tutoring resources, um, all kinds of pre-K resources for our kids who are out there. Um, the first is to create a directory of the pre-K programs, including cost openings, program features, and the child care subcommittee has really kicked off the ball on that work. Um, to also partner with Reach Out and Read, which is a group that's working right now to increase preschool literacy, making sure that our hope is that all of our students are entering school reading on grade level and that we keep them there. Um, and thinking about broad alternatives, this is sort of what we were getting at to the simple answer of more spots for pre-K funded by the city schools. We recognize um, the General Assembly has something to do with that and so does our city. And so if we can utilize the resources that are already out there in a better, more constructive way, we think we can make a real impact. All right. Thank you, Laura. I'd like to mention if, that if if you have not looked in your program, a lot of these um, action items are included in your program, as well as the primary members uh, or facilitators uh, for your reference, too. So we'll move on to the food disparity group, represented on stage by Ms. Liza Dobson. Thank you, Liza. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks John. Um, so we, as a group, uh, have met three times since the first May 4th meeting. Um, we met in June, July, and um, last month, uh, and our action items have been refined since the beginning. Um, out of our first meeting we had, we came out of that meeting with four or five action items. In our first meeting we added two more. <laughs> um, and then in our uh, second meeting we refined them down to uh, the three that are um, behind me. And <clears throat> the third one has actually shifted a little bit um, since that as well. So. Um, we are changing with the ever-changing community needs, so that's great. Um, so our first action item is, um, out of the first conversation on May 4th, uh, one of the, I have a, from the notes that says, compute a cost analysis for small grocery stores that could help create jobs and provide food in food deserts. Um, so a grocery store in the food desert areas was um, a need that was indicated in our first conversation. And in our um, subsequent conversations, uh, there was the Oasis Project, um, which is a, a project that's been trying to bring a grocery store to the downtown area for a while, um, came up in our conversations. And the group decided um, that they wanted to support that as the community outreach component. Um, and so that's how uh, the Poverty to Progress uh, Food Disparities Group has been moving forward with that. Um, and for more information, um, you can check out the Facebook group. It's facebook.com backslash Project Oasis Lynchburg. Um, so check that out. We are the outreach uh, component of that. 
Um, our second, uh, second action item um, is still kind of in the works. We're still refining what that looks like, but um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of conversation about how we didn't want to lose um, sight of the need uh, for supporting the elderly folks in our community. Um, and so um, that was something that really rose to the top in our discussions. So um, the idea of recruiting volunteers and increasing collaboration between existing organizations um, is something that we're going to be moving forward with. Um, there was a survey that was started um, <clears throat> going around to the existing organizations just to gather information. Um, that's still in the works. Um, and then we've had a couple of representatives from organizations that have joined us and started communicating with each other. So um, we're still, still in the works with that. Our third action item um, started off um, in, with a conversation on redirecting any, school, any uh, surplus of food items um, that in Lynchburg City Schools, uh, redirecting those towards um, food pantries or backpack programs or anything like that. Um, and so when we set up a conversation with uh, Beth Morris and Tony um, Hill um, from the nutrition program in the schools, um, they, they are already doing this great work. Um, so they ha uh, Beth has been in the position, I believe, for about two years, and she's been doing everything that she can um, to redirect that food. Um, and uh, she's also working really hard on doing uh, summer feeding programs um, so sh they are working on, Beth and Tony have been doing share tables in the schools um, and uh, serving leftover food at after school programs and just really, really great work. So um, rather than supporting, rather than um, going down that route, we agreed in our last meeting to um, help expand the summer feeding programs um, across the city. So we have uh, developed a survey to gather information um, from existing sites that aren't already receiving meals from the school system um, during the summertime. Uh, if they would like to receive free meals, um, they can fill out the survey. I left some with Kim Word um, at the front table at where everyone registered and got their name tags. So if you know of a summer feeding site um, that it would like to participate in the program, please take that and fill that survey out. Um, and please send it to me. My email and um, my office address is on the bottom of that survey. So uh, we are collecting those over the next um, couple months. So by January of 2018, um, then sites will be audited in the spring um, and signed up and we'll be able to receive free meals um, as, as needed throughout um, next summer. Um, and so please give me those by January 2018. <laughs> Um, so a, a couple other things I wanted to note on the side is that we talked a lot about resource, um, developing a resource directory for food, re food emergency food sources, um, emergency food organizations. Um, and so we, uh, I've been in conversation with Kevin Cam of the Poverty 101 group, um, and we're in communication with them about supporting their resource directory um, that they will talk about a little bit later. Um, we are also in communication with the Bridges of Central Virginia group. Um, they do not have a food group, so we um, might become that uh, for them. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, I think that's everything I have. Thanks. Thank you, Liza. Next, we will have uh, the health and mental health group represented, represented on stage by Tabitha Robertson. Thanks. Well, first, I do want to give grief to my co-facilitator, Michael Elliott, because I told him I was going to let you know he was out in Vermont, but really, he's working out there. So otherwise, you'd have him up here. Um, so I did tell him I would do that. Uh, so with our group, we actually had gotten um, the action items down to 14 originally. And so in the last group, we actually said, OK, how are we going to get this down to two action items? So the clever people in our group decided that they would blend some of them. And I know if you're looking at it on it, it doesn't seem quite like that, and I will explain. So our very first action item is the improve access to services. And then what we did was we attached other parts of the other action items, such as including thoughts on keeping college graduates in the area by offering incentives such as increasing internship opportunities, loan forgiveness, and job security. Because we were looking at the fact that we have such a shortage in both areas of health and mental health of the providers, and that the, 
the sad part is we have so many schools that actually educate those providers, but what's happening is they're leaving. And they're leaving for a variety of reasons. Um, one, actually, we did realize that sometimes it's about policies that need to change because of opportunities in this state versus in other states. So that was one thing we were looking at. Um, so we definitely said that we needed to partner with uh, colleges and with the community to really look at how to do we build those incentives so we can keep more of those providers here. Since we had our community meeting back in May, um, we've been really meeting with uh, several of our partners, and what we realized is there has been an increase in some services uh, since that time, and we thought we would, we would share what those were. Um, one thing is we've got the community access network that's going to open up their large facility on 5th Street. And one of the nice parts about what they're going to provide is that they're going to be um, doing primary care, urgent care, they're going to have a pharmacy, they're going to have mental health services, and they're going to do this from 11 to 11 every day except for Wednesdays, and they're going to have their free clinic uh, facility open on Main Street for that. Um, and then they're going to accept the insured as well as the uninsured. So again, that's going to increase some access to services. <laughs> it's awesome. Johnson Health Center, which is a federally um, qualified medical center, they've actually in have made some changes to their services because you can now access mental health services without being a primary care uh, patient. So you can get either or or both. It doesn't have to be based on one. Um, also, they're now doing free transportation to those who are living in the Lynchburg and Amherst area. When somebody schedules an appointment, they just need to let them know that they need transportation to the appointment. They also just moved into a larger location on Atherholt for their pediatrics and their OBGYN, and they just added a dentist. So again, adding more services in the area. Uh, Horizon Behavioral Health has now done open access for admissions. That is in one location now off of Langhorn, so that is open from 8.30 to 3. Um, there's been an increased number of beds in the crisis stabilization unit for mental health, as well as doing detox beds for substance use. Um, also, Horizon has been hiring more nurse practitioners because we've had a hard time finding psychiatrists because they're just not being educated at this point. They're not going into um, that profession. So we've been hiring nurse, nurse practitioners in all of our locations. And then we recently received a $2.2 million grant to provide services to homeless youth and young adults. So definitely to improve access to services. Um, so that was our first one. And then the second one, um, our action item was more effective communication, and that was to be across all areas of the community about the needs and issues regarding health and mental health. One of the things that we looked at with effective communication is the fact that those new resources that we were telling you about, where do you know, where do you see that? The problem is the communication isn't really out there. One of the things we were talking about is why don't we have billboards or signs or things in the areas in the communities where people need this information? So we know it as providers because at the table I have quite a few providers who are there. We know the information, but it's just not getting out into the community. And so that's one of the things we were talking about. We definitely need to figure out how to get that information out there on it. Um, and then also one of the things we realize is with our work groups, actually what's happened is it's, it's gotten down to where it's more of the providers and partners. We don't have as many of the community partners now. And so that's one of the things we realize we need to actually start moving our meetings more into community centers and really getting involved in the community more so. So that's coming. And then also one of the other things that came up during uh, working on effective communication and learning more was that we are actually in a political year, right? We have our, our governor. And one of the things that we said was since we have our colleges and, and different people, we should have people, someone who can help share information with the public on who candidates are and what their stance is on health and mental health issues so that we can help the public make more informed the, um, decisions in, when they're making their selections. So that was one of the things we were talking about with this effective communication that we needed to improve on. Thank you, Tab. We'll now have a representative from the housing focus group, and that would be Ms. Denise Cruz. Thank you, Denise. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Our committee has been very active. Our first belief is that everyone in our community has a right to safe, decent, and affordable housing. Um, our first goal, we had two meetings um, since the May meeting, and the second meeting, we actually narrowed down about 25 things that we wanted to get accomplished with regards to housing down to two. 
Um, the first goal is really establishing a housing navigator. Uh, a lot of the people at the table are providers of individuals who are below poverty and some of them are homeless. In our community, we have something called um, the Coordinated Housing Intake and Access Person. This is a one-stop shop. This is a place for individuals who are facing homelessness can go to one place and get resources um, if they are facing a housing crisis. And so we saw how well that was. Instead of having a client go from agency to agency to try to get assistance, they can go to one place, have one number, and be able to find out all of the resources that are within the community to help them with that crisis. We've been very active. We're hoping this housing navigator, we've recommended that it be at the housing authority, and we're hoping that the position will be um, filled by December of this year. So that's a great plus. And this will also help with the landlords. Um, this person will keep a running list of active landlords and private landlords mm -hmm. so that someone who has a rent burden crisis can find a more affordable housing option so that they aren't spending more than 50% of their income on rent. The second action item that we decided that we wanted to put forth would be to conduct a study. We need to know what is exactly happening in our community. And so uh, the Housing Coalition, which are providers that actually work with these um, individuals and clients on a daily basis, such as the Housing Authority, Rush Homes, Lynchburg Community Action Group, and Miriam's House. We formed the Housing Coalition of Lynchburg. And so we would like to conduct a study to really see what the impact um, of not having enough affordable housing is in our community. We will have, um, work with VHDA, Virginia Housing Development Authority in Richmond, um, to conduct an independent study and do surveys and meet with clients and citizens in our community to really find out what their needs are and what impact having um, a lack of affordable housing is. So those are our two goals. Thank you, Denise. We'll now have the legal system focus group represented by Ms. Jane Henderson. Hello. <clears throat> hello, hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Jane Henderson, and I'm co-facilitating the legal systems group with Heidi Land. Um, I signed up for this group in May, just as, as a, oh, I signed up for this group in May as a participant um, because I was very concerned about how, particularly about how mass incarceration um, really lays a heavy burden on the poor in our community. And um, I, I began being interested in this because I worked with teenagers in foster care at Lynchburg DSS for 20 years. And so over and over I saw how um, involvement with the justice system and, and uh, detention and incarceration really was a great barrier to um, these young people being able to move along in their lives. And in the last couple of years, I've kept up with um, some of these young people who aren't young anymore. They're in their 30s, and they've been incarcerated um, for most of their adult life. And a couple of them have very serious mental health problems. So it's something heavy on my heart. So um, when our group met together, we realized that legal system is just a, it's an impossibly large subject. And, and um, so we tried to just get as much input as we could from all of our participants about what they saw as the parts of the legal system that they, they felt needed attention. And it, everything, came up, landlord-tenant relationships, um, school truancy or suspensions leading to court involvement, the, the enormous costs associated with being incarcerated from um, cost of legal representation to fees and fines and even getting medicines in, in prison. And so that puts a huge burden on families. Um, and we also heard from a lot of people about racial bias and a lot of, you know, from, from policing to sentencing to treatment in, in um, facilities. 
Um, so when it came time to try to narrow our focus enough to come up with two actionable items, <clears throat> we decided to just look at the beginning and the end, to look at how, how we could prevent uh, particularly young, well, young people, on my heart, but how can we prevent people from negative involvement with the legal system and then how we can give support for people who come back into the community after they've been incarcerated. Um, we're just getting started on this and so what we're um, planning to do is research what's available um, in our area and we'll be working with mental health and um, with education and with uh, some of the other groups to find out, you know, there's a lot of overlap in, um, in the work we do. So we'll first be researching what's out there, uh, what's available, and how to make that known. Um, and then down the road, <clears throat> as, we, as we get more information and make more connections, we'll work on trying to find where the biggest gaps are and a way to um, address those. So, you know, we would appreciate involvement by any of you who are interested in this. If, you know, I'm not an attorney or a judge or a legislator. I'm just a citizen, and so we need a lot of, um, we need a lot of expertise at our table. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Next, we will have Mrs. Margaret Schmidt with the Poverty 101 group. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Poverty 101 is an overarching type of group. As you see, we don't have a singular focus or a functional area. So we're t our group is taking the broadest view of this issue and, and hope to be a catalyst for collaboration and some synergy among the groups. Uh, I'm representing Kevin Cam and Jenny Jones, our facilitator group, as well as a team of about 20 people who have met and are committed to this um, might sound like talk, more talk. <laughs> you know, we're, we're committed to increasing the dialogue in the community education. Um, and while it might sound like talk, we really believe pretty strongly in the tangible value of giving everyone a voice and a seat at the table. A lot of the, our meetings have not been open, have not been participated or attended by many of the people that we're hoping to help. So we hope to expand the opportunities for dialogue by increasing accessibility and the appeal to those in our community that are actually living in poverty. And we want to share the knowledge about the impact of poverty on the community, um, not just for those in poverty, but those with sufficient means that, uh, you know, what does poverty actually cost the city? There, we believe there is a tangible cost there. Uh, we also want to help community members who are not in poverty understand the myriad stories of poverty. Uh, we've talked about, everyone's talked about how complex this issue is, how individualized it is. So there are many, many stories, and our group thinks that additional dialogue will, in fact, help expand the knowledge of those stories. Uh, we also are committed to creating a directory of services. I think that this particular item was on everybody's first list. Uh, if you were here on May 4th, it came up over and over again. So we're hoping to compile one accessible document, database, something, a directory of current community resources and services. So for example, to bring together the resources like United Ways 211, the Human Services Resource Guide, the Drug Court Resources, uh, Lynchburg City Schools Resources, and the resources and services that all of these teams that you see here are putting together. Uh, we also want to think that overall we should research some innovative and successful eth efforts from other communities. We don't want to reinvent the wheel if we can't avoid it. We want to find areas that might serve as models for us and might apply here. We're a unique community, but there's also a lot of things that are common to this issue. So we're hoping to bring those things together so that we can further the talk, the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Next we'll have the transportation group represented by Brian Booth. 
Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm with the transportation group along with uh, Mary Winston Deacon, with Humankind, and John Salmon, and we've been the facilitators for that group. Um, we've met a few times over the summer, and early on in our discussions, we identified that transportation was a critical piece to this initiative. Um, it touches just about every focus group that's up here um, being presented tonight. For example, you might have the ability to obtain uh, the best child care in the world, but if you don't have reliable transportation to get you there, how effective is that child care for you? The same goes for employment, education, and health care, and so on. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we understood the barriers that individuals face and with regard to transportation um, so that we could identify strategies um, to help them overcome those barriers. Our first goal is to conduct a survey to gather this data. Um, I am the general manager of GLTC, uh, the Greater Lynchburg Transit Company, and we're currently undertaking the redevelopment of our transit development plan. And this plan is going to outline the path that we will take over the next six to 10 years. It's gonna identify areas of need in the community and then also identify the necessary resources um, that we will need to implement um, services to meet those needs. Um, while we know some of the areas um, of need already, it's very important um, that your input, that we receive your input on that, um, and it's very valuable input. So we encourage everyone here um, to take the survey. Um, we're not only asking for information from the current riders of the bus system, but we also wanna hear from those that do not ride the bus system because in order for us to improve um, the services that we offer, we need to understand for those that do not use the service, why are you not using it so that we can improve and make it better for everyone. Um, we are on a kind of a fast track because we are part of, the survey is part of a larger initiative. Um, so the survey will be conducted um, through the month of October. You can access it at gltc.metroquest.com. Um, and for those of you that don't have anything to write that down with, there are some business cards in the lobby at the registration table. Look for the GLTC bus stop sign. Um, take several, a handful of those cards um, and distribute them. If you work for an organization, please distribute them in that organization or people that could benefit from um, giving their feedback. Um, and also by taking the survey, you can also enter to win a uh, $5 gift card to either Starbucks or Walmart. So there's a little bit of an incentive to take about five minutes of your time to give us that information. The second goal um, that we focused on is kind of a two-part goal, and it involves the development of a collaborative database uh, to connect and coordinate um, existing services. As Margaret mentioned just a minute ago about um, the existing services that we have and trying to connect those and use what we have and not reinvent the wheel, um, one of our team members um, had this great idea of developing a database. And um, the database, the idea for the database is to be called Link Up. And it's going to do exactly what the name of it says. It's going to link individuals to the existing services that we have. Um, the idea is to, for information to be put into the database, and then that individual could receive information on all of the available resources that could help them, um, also any organizations that could help them. We're currently working with a computer class at Liberty University who's developing this prototype um, as a capstone project, and we anticipate having um, something available for testing uh, sometime this winter. The second concept is um, a ride-sharing app, and we have the, the idea is to call it Move Up, and it's going to be very similar to Lyft and Uber, but it'll be unique to Lynchburg. Um, the ride-sharing app is going to be available community-wide and will assist with the coordination of transportation resources to move individuals throughout um, our community. Um, we envision this app to be a fund generator, to actually generate money um, through, through the transportation, but the intent of any funds that are generated is to be put back toward um, providing support to individuals that need to use the service um, that would not have the means to use it uh, otherwise. And the reason that we felt that this was such an important um, concept is that we recognize that while GLTC is a great um, resource to our community, it is in no way can meet all of the needs that we have for transportation. So we wanted to make sure that we had some type of uh, stopgap that can 
pick up where GLTC is not able to cover. So um, we anticipate having some type of prototype or beta testing to be um, done sometime in the spring of 2018. Thank you, Brian. Next we will have Bob Levesque representing the Workforce Development Group. I can't sit behind a desk, I'm sorry. Um, and I'm at the end, so it makes it a little bit easier. Before I talk about workforce development, which dovetails with virtually every one of these groups, uh, a couple things. During our initial session, we came up with countless ideas. Unfortunately, if we're going to be successful, we had to narrow that down. So we are only taking two. Those that committed or brought forward all these ideas don't think that was for waste. We've captured them, but one thing I learned in a business career, if you try and do too many things at once, you're not going to accomplish any of them well. So we're going to take two, and we're going to hit them out of the ballpark. So that's a key thing. Another thing I can assure everybody here, having uh, worked at a large employer here in town, I'm retired now, but one of the most common problems we had was finding good, qualified, and skilled people. That still exists today. Make no bones about it. Uh, but you hear all the time about skilled workforce. We need a skilled workforce. That scares some people. Because skill levels vary from employer to employer. You know, we scare some people away. They think they need to be college educated and this and that. No, there's just different levels but we have to make sure that our workforce is employment ready. So when you look at our first goal, we're talking about utilizing and coordinating, and this is the key word, folks, existing resources. Our community has some of the finest resources I've ever seen in my career. The problem is, sometimes, and this isn't being critical, it's just fact, the left doesn't know what the right's doing and vice versa, so our goal is to utilize existing resources. It's going to allow us to get this accomplished quicker, more cost effectively. So we're going to focus on the existing resources. But you cannot work today if you don't have basic computer skills. That's just a fact. The days of just strictly old manual labor are almost non-existent. So I'm not talking about being a programmer. I'm talking about being able to point and click and do some things on a computer. Interviewing skills. If you haven't noticed, and I've got uh, two children, uh, there are kids today that really struggle with communicating, if, unless it's a text or a FaceTime or something like that. We need to get people to learn how to communicate, because if you're going to be successful in the workplace, you have to have basic communication skills, and that includes interviewing. We've got great resources. Joan Foster's over there, Beacon of Hope. What a great way to take some of our young students and give them the confidence to get out there. Basic financial literacy. Goes without saying, but you better be able to add and subtract, multiply and divide and do some of the basics. And then employment etiquette. I don't know about you, but I sometimes walk into a place and I wonder how the heck is somebody allowing that person to work there. They look like crap, they talk t terribly, um, so we've got to teach them etiquette. I knew at Donnelly, uh, if you don't show up for work, there are people who don't think you need to show up. Guess what? You're going to get fired. And that leads to this system we've got where people are constantly unemployed. So we've got to teach them that. And here's probably the one that I personally buy into uh, so much because I've lived it, I know people that it's impacted, and it came out loud and clear in our initial focus session. We want to create a second chance employment program. How many people in this room, by a show of hands, have made a mistake in your life? No, I'm, I'm being dead serious here. I mean, I used to kid people, don't take this too serious, but if people knew what I did when I was a lot younger, I'd be dead or I'd be in jail. And sometimes, sometimes people get caught. And I'm not talking about, you know, certain crimes and things,
But people get certain, make a mistake when they're 18, 19. We, we've all been young and dumb. And guess what happens? All of a sudden, you get a big X on your forehead, and you have trouble getting a job. So we want to work with the employers and partner a development with the employers and the municipalities. But I'm going to say this, and I want everybody to understand it, because I'm very outspoken about this. These are businesses. These businesses need to make money. That's how a business stays in business. And if we're going to do this program, it is our job, our responsibility, to show, that, show our businesses there is a return on investment for contributing into this program. Because I know what it's like, how much it costs to replace somebody, retrain somebody. So if we can get some folks that show up for work, do a good job, and they're happy to have the job. That's been my personal experience. I had a couple of folks I worked with. I still don't know to this day what was in their past. I really don't care. All I know, I would have hired a hundred more of them because it could snow three feet in Lynchburg and they showed up. They, they were so thankful to have a job. And, you know, that's what we've got to tap into. I'm not talking about some of the people that don't want to work, but we've got so many good people in our community that just need that second chance. And that's where one of the ways we're going to get it to work is we're going to line it up with some mentoring. You know, I was involved in a mentoring program with the city of Lynchburg years ago called Mentor One. Mentored an eighth grade young lady out of uh, one of the middle schools. She just graduated from the Naval Academy. She was just brilliant. And what we've got to do is, and it doesn't have to be a senior level executive, and I'm going to ask tonight for people to think about volunteering to be a mentor for somebody, but just somebody that can provide some counsel, some guidance, some common sense for people that maybe aren't getting it at home or they're afraid to go to their boss. But if we can get that mentorship going, uh, is Margette still here? If she's not. We are blessed to have one of the greatest economic development people around. She's right there. In the middle. Where is she? Right there in the middle. All right. Well, Margette, I heard her. not only does she dress well, but she's also a great economic developer. But I can speak from personal experience. When Margette Upshur calls an employer and says, hey, I know so-and-so who would be a good fit for your opening. I'd be willing to bet a lot of money, and I don't gamble, that that person's going to go send them over because of the relationship Margette has. And we've got so many people in this community that have great reputations and great relationships, and if they'll tie in and mentor somebody and make that recommendation and vouch, the other side of it is the person you're vouching for better not let you down because this whole system will go up in smoke. And I don't think it will because we'll tap the right people. But those are the two goals. I mean, there's a lot of other things we could do, but if we can get them employment ready with those basic skills and then give some of our people that have made mistakes, again, we all have, a second chance, my guess is they'll turn out to be some of the finest, most dedicated employees we have. And for the employers, it's going to provide a very solid return on investment because, again, businesses need to make money or they don't stay in business. Thanks. Now I guess we're going to have some Q&A. I want to thank our, our panelists, uh, all, of, all of the facilitators, all of those who have volunteered their time and uh, contributed to this effort. And thank all of you for coming out this evening to participate as well. I want to um, just say that I'm, I'm very excited about the, the way this journey is going. And I'd like now to open up the microphones to anyone who has questions for the panel or any of us up here or anyone in the audience, too. There's some uh, members of the audience that will be able to answer questions as well. All right. I think the mics are on the, in the center, right behind you. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. First of all, my name is PJ Reed. Whoa, loud mic. <laughs> you, you found it. 
Yeah, from heart to heart, the Fairview Heights area. Back in uh, 2014, I went to housing, and I got about a four-page document about condemned properties throughout the city. Back at that uh, time, the system was yellow was condemned, red was uh, condemned with exterior incompliances. 122 red, 114 yellow with a total of 236. Question is to housing as to where does that status of those condemned, which well, hopefully are now out of the way, mowed down and made way for another house, or updated that house, what's the status on that? Because we all know, since we are all here talking about progress in Lynchburg, sooner or later, those houses are gonna to have to become new to facilitate the people come into this city. What's the progress on that? Is someone here from inspections? <laughs> that's what it's gonna take, an, right. That's an inspections question. Uh, okay. you, you, let's give Kent White a hand here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Great question. Good evening. My name is Kent White. I'm with the Department of Community Development. Um, we still do have an inventory of condemned houses throughout the city. Um, council took a step earlier or late last year to require those owners to start registering the properties. Our goal with that program is to start developing an inventory, directing the owners to resources that may be available to them, or in cases where they need to be demolished, working with the property owner for that. Okay, I do remember that letter coming out. As a matter of fact, it was uh, to people who had uh, houses that were not rented or not owned or out of sequence or something, some reason why they were not being lived in. You're right. Yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Second question, well, that's actually, it's not a question, it's more of an observation. It looks like uh, out of this nine committees up there, seven of them, a lot of the problems or a lot of the initiatives that you speak of can be done by faith-based organizations, churches and other ministries. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm one of the ministries in the Fairview Heights area, and we would love to take a hand in facilitating what uh, you people can give us so that uh, some of these inquiries, some of these things can be dealt with as far as families are concerned. And Mr. Levesque, believe me, you're spot on with that. I'm retired myself, and I used to work a lot of security, and sometimes we did have people, <laughs> times where people didn't show up, and I had to work double shifts for it. Thanks again. Thank you for your, your question, sir. There's also the, uh, the form out at the, uh, at the table for faith-based organizations. If you would take the time to maybe fill one of those out and drop it in the box or send me an email or call, and we'll, we'll get uh, the, the, your church and faith group information. We appreciate that. Next question right here. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Dan Harrison. I'm the new pastor at Church of the Covenant. I don't think I've met everyone there, but it's uh, nice to meet you. Um, one of my, I had two questions. My first one is about child care. So, Jane, I just uh, had a question about have we looked at maybe looking at um, generating more home-based daycares um, as a possible in-part solution, which could also, of course, parallel for economic development and lift for people. I don't know the regulations on that. I'm not an expert. I was just kind of curious. Um, what I know about that, and I'm no uh, expert in licensing, reg in licensing, but um, from what I understand, for home-based to be licensed, you have to be licensed if you have five children or more in your home, and um, so you would call the Department of Social Services in order to um, get a licensing inspector to come and help you set that up. And they have, you know, regulations that you need to follow in order to become licensed. I thought to also say that Humankind has the Child Care Resource Center. That might be a step that will help you get the home up to regulations, and that service is offered free to our community. 
So humankind, and then the next step would be to get their licensing. But I would uh, suggest maybe that you call humankind. They'll help you with that. I also, I meant to mention before, um, I know Karen Wesley is here somewhere tonight from Smart Beginnings, and that's another program um, housed over the United Way that helps um, set up quality child care programs, and they would be a really good resource also. I wasn't asking for myself to set up a program, but I, I appreciate that. I was curious if it was something that was con being considered in, the, in, your, in your committee, perhaps, as a solution for providing more additional um, um, home care, I mean, daycare for, for children. Uh, is that something you guys consider at all? Or? Yeah, and there are some, there are a lot in the community yeah. uh, right now, um, but still more are needed, and more are needed that are licensed. That's really right. important. And there was also discussed in terms of uh, in, in commu community engagement and, and the uh, parents or grandparents in neighborhoods getting together with their, their neighbors and providing child care of that, that, of that nature in probably less than five individuals. But that was part of the initial dis discussion is that we're all a community uh, that's looking for the same goals. So we should trust, you know, with, we have, do have some support from the professionals like Jane, but we uh, would look to some of those natural supports as well to provide some child care. It would be less expensive too. Thank you. And the only other question, I apologize, is just um, for workforce development. I, I, you know, um, some from my church and I were in D.C. just last week, and we were looking at microloans as a program, an economic model, um, to help especially folks that are um, dealing with poverty. Um, small loans to entrepreneurs that cannot qualify for traditional loans um, because of credit score. And uh, this is kind of to counter some of the payday loan, the predatory loan uh, companies that are out here, title loans, things like that, that help uh, impoverished people become more impoverished. Um, and I was wondering if um, possibly, is, is, are we looking at anything like that to help entrepreneurs? I, I know the, the training was great, and of course, second chances are awesome. I just was wondering if there was also some thought on countering some of that. Was that brought up at all in your committee? That, that issue came up, um, and it's important, but there were so many that came up, and we really were tasked to focus on the critical few right now, and I think if we can get these two, uh, you know, we can handle some of those on an as-needed basis if they come up as one-offs, but right now, that's on our list, but it didn't make the top two. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Michelle Woodruff Cooper. I am a pastor, and I live in Greenfield, James Crossing, James Apartments, whatever the name is today. Um, I thank God for where I'm living, um, but I have major concerns for my community because oftentimes I feel that James Crossings has just been set aside um, and forgotten in many ways, in particularly the transportation. Um, since I've been there, I've been there three years living as a missionary, in particularly transportation with regards to having one bus stop for all these people to walk to. But the other thing for me is this city does not stop on Sundays and there is no bus transportation on Sundays. Everybody says, well, Pastor Mimi, we have cabs. Okay, but it's $20 for me to ride from James Crossing to Kemper Street. That's too much for a, com for a community that's already struggling financially, which ties into then your employment. I can't apply for a job at McDonald's and get that job and tell them I won't be able to work on Sunday and I can't work past 8.30. Please, in your survey, have a question as to how many people have been affected and infected by this. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Real quick in that, um, just to address that question, that is one item that we did include in the survey was um, weekend service. Um, so please fill out the survey. That's the data that our consultants need to be able to determine what um, plans we have moving forward. Thank you, Brian. Next question, go right ahead. 
Okay, my name is Kira Roberts and I teach at R.S. Payne Elementary School. Um, I wanted to ask how many educators were on the committee for the education um, aspect of this, people who are actually on the front lines um, doing the work, and to make a secondary comment, which is that I appreciate the fact that it was brought up about um, early childhood reading. Um, I think that if you're not aware as a community member, um, we are at a crossroads with our discipline in our schools and what we're finding is that almost um, definitely over half, I would dare to say 75% or more um, of our discipline issues also involve children who are not reading on grade level. So I appreciate the fact that you guys are looking at that, but I would like to know um, how many educators are on your committee. Thanks, Kira. Um, we had probably our first meeting, we had upwards of 50 folks, and I think our second one was around 40. There were um, a number of community organizations represented, but there were also a number of folks from the schools who were there. So we have administrators who have been educators in their lifetime and are now downtown. We had, um, we had assistant principals from our middle schools. We had teachers from our middle schools and elementary schools, folks in early childhood. So um, please come, please come to the next parts. You know, the ideas that were thrown out on the table were many and they were diverse. And these were the two that kind of bubbled to the top. And we tried, I think, a lot like healthcare to cram as many under the same goals as we could. But, um, but we need educators in the room, so please come. My name is Judy Schultz, and I came to the uh, May meeting and sat in the education focus group. And I love your idea of the mentoring and tutoring, but I hope you will put a component in to really train the tutors and the mentors, because I know a lot of us mean to do well when we help tutor, but some of us are beyond the age when we had math at a certain level, and we need a little skill improvement. So I hope you'll put that into your tutoring, tutoring so we can really be effective. Um, that is absolutely part of that component, that we don't just want folks out there. Well, we do want folks out there given the love, but they need to have a little training behind the love. Good evening. Three quick um, things. Two of those are questions. For the comment section, Laura Hamilton. Um, you really touched my spirit with your appropriate and compassionate use of the terms our children and village. Thank you. Jane Henderson, thank you for stepping up and mentioning uh, the critical impact for fathers and mothers coming out of jails and prisons, which ties into Educator Roberts not reading on grade level tied into discipline issues in the school. Also the comment of um, prison growth population being based on third grade reading scores of black boys. I don't know what it is today. Brian Booth, one question for you. For many who do not have internet access, are there paper copies of the survey available and where? And Bob, thank you for being outspoken and adamant about second chances. Good evening. Let, let, let me give them, if they have one, the panelists wanted a, an opportunity to answer those questions, we'll give them just a second. Thank you. Yes, just to address the comment about the paper surveys, surveys currently there are not any surveys, but please call our office and stop by the transfer center and we will make accommodations to assist you in filling out one. Um, we will set up um, tablets or laptops or something at the transfer station to assist with that. And we want to make sure that we take down every barrier that we can. Yes, good evening. My name is Pastor Dorothy Smith. And my question is, as the uh, pastor just said, it was about entrepreneurship. I am an entrepreneur. And it is, you know, 
the American dream is to go out, get some education, and work for someone. Uh, I had talked to a, a foreigner that came here and they got a lot of businesses. They said they were taught coming up as children to have ownership of businesses. My father had a wood business, but that inspired me to have my own business. And I think that someone should be on the panel talking about entrepreneurship because everybody just is not going to be working for somebody else. So that is a great issue that we really need to address. I would like to say, um, just to touch on your question, uh, Ms. Smith, that the um, workforce development is outside. And a part of workforce development um, is not only just going to work for someone, but it's also learning the skills, getting credentials. But if people want to go into entrepreneurship or own their own businesses, there's coursework at the community college. There are avenues to that for folks who need to learn financial literacy, business skills. They will they are a resource for that and so along with workforce development which gets people into immediate employment there is an avenue also for entrepreneurship for those who are interested in learning more or having credentials or understanding how to organize a business there's a small business development center so that's not off the radar because it was mentioned before i just wanted to say that if people express that interest the resources are in our community to help that thank you Thank you. I also wanted to mention on the, on the GLTC survey that we do have uh, access to online with the library system as well. I'm not sure the format of the survey, but if you can fill it out and it's not uh, cumbersome to do so, then if you have an address or you give us a call, we'll mail you a copy. So that, that, that will work fine. Next Good question. evening. Um, my name is Angela Cox. And um, I work in the community, and I also volunteer in the community. Um, I want to piggyback on the school teacher's um, response um, that works at Payne School when she um, expressed that children are not, not reading on grade level. Now, what I want to say, you know, with the workforce, uh, I was in that group, and I did not get a call this summer. I really wish that I would have because um, I would have been excited to be a part of the group um, this summer and spend my summer giving my time and service. But if, if um, children are not reading on grade level, because when I worked in the Pride Center, we had children who were, and that was an alternative education, and children had been kicked out of regular school, traditional school, because they, um, whatever problems, you know, they had discipline problems or whatsoever. But once they got in, with us in the eighth grade, we noticed that eighth grade students who should have been in 10th or 12th grade were reading on second, third, and fourth grade level. So if a, excuse me, if a student is not reading up to par on the level that they need to be reading on, how do we expect the adults who are coming into the workforce to be able to read, to be able to understand, and to be able to have comprehension so they can do their work effectively. Yes, the financial literacy um, aspect plays an important part, but what are we going to do to connect from workforce to education to get these adults up to par reading so they can be effective in the workforce. Um, probably to answer your question, workforce development system in our community has um, partners. And those partners are adult basic education, literacy programs, because for everyone here, the credentialing programs, um, whether it's IT or healthcare or they require that people read on a ninth grade level at least. And for like say IT, they prefer to have people at a 10th grade math level for going through credentialing programs. So when they go into the workforce process of programs or any of the programs in the lobby, they're gonna do assessments. And you, they also connect to send people 
who want to increase their skills in order to pass assessments, to go through the intensive coursework that these classes require. Um, so there is a network that will help people. One thing that I will say behind that question is you're right, reading is just fundamental. Everyone knows that, or we know that. Um, but we have to convince people to work harder, smarter, and go above and beyond. And so you have people, like you said, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, um, they test on a sixth grade level, but they're functioning every day in jobs, in service industry, and that sort of thing. So fortunately, there are compassionate people within the workforce system, within adult basic ed, who nurture people to get them up to the skill level they need. But we have to make sure that we convince people that there is work behind this process that they have to put in. So the words willing, able, hopeful, and motivated, that encompasses just what you're saying and what I'm explaining as well. But I, I, will, um, I will say this, and I'm not tr I'm trying to go back and forth. Um, a service job, working at McDonald's, just working the cash register and sweeping the floor, that's, that can't take care of your family in the long run. Right. You know, they need more, more jobs where they're able to move up and to make a salary where they're able to take care of their family. It's okay to start out at McDonald's, but they shouldn't have to because of their reading level or comprehension level, stay at McDonald's working a cash register sweeping the floor for 10 and 15 years. Trine, can I, can I add something to that? Trine, can I add something to that? Your point is so valid about the reading and comprehension and you know, some work I was doing with United Way, uh, and I go back to the, the former, was it, the Community Dialogue on Race and Racism, and I won't embarrass my friend that I became very close with who I was involved with that, uh, but she and I had a similar discussion, and I give her so much credit, and this is where the faith-based community could come into play. She took the idea of going back to her church, and challenging the parishioners to take on a student, could be fifth grade, could be eighth grade, and start tutoring and mentoring that person. And it was great. You know, they had 10 people step up to do that. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but one thing I've learned since moving to Lynchburg, we have a ton of churches. And if you could get 10 people from every church or synagogue in our community to take on the responsibility of mentoring and tutoring 10 of those people you just mentioned, think about how much that would help. And that isn't involving the government or anybody else. That's just people helping people within their own faith-based community. And I give that friend of mine so much credit for actually going back to her church and challenging those people. And it wasn't even like she had to twist arms. They were more than willing to do it. I just think we need to get out there and coordinate it, and it can happen. Thank you, Bob. We have about maybe five more minutes on questions. Go right ahead. Uh, my name is Ronaldo Lynch. and. Um, the gentleman who just spoke touched on what I was going to speak about, actually. But first, I'd like to commend everyone on the stage who has came tonight, who has come tonight, to tell something that is being put into action or given suggestions. And I'd uh, like to thank everybody who's come, who's, who's sitting out here in the audience to hear, because this was, has, was, has to happen for something to happen. Now, what I'm saying now is that um, Trine mentioned that there are churches here and there are a lot of churches in the city of Lynchburg. How can we make it a collective effort? Not just by faith because we're all in this together. Your kids go to school, well my kids are all grown now, but anyway kids go to school together uh, they play together, they're not all the same religion or whatever, uh, and Sunday's the most segregated day of the week. But we all love the Lord. But my point is that how can we uh, extend the resources of 
the faith community put together and make a difference? Okay, I'm going to tell you, um, Ronaldo, what we're going to do. We've already done it. We've worked on it the last couple of weeks. We've sent out an email, and if your church didn't get it, tonight that same email is outside. We're asking every house of faith in this community to step up, sign up, and tell us what resource you're willing to commit to help with this effort. Because we are city of churches and faith communities. And I think you've hit on something um, that we ourselves want to make sure that others in this community sign on for that are our houses of faith. Now, you can just be a member of a committee, but we really want to know if you have spaces in your child care, if you have a child care program, if you have buses sitting at your church that never move except on Sunday, to take those buses out and help some of our folks. I'm here in the James River Crossing. They need to get to some places on Sunday. That that might be something that you would consider the tra helping the transportation committee, or maybe holding some workshops on, on readiness skills and being prepared to work. So, however, I'm just asking our houses of faith and our um, different communities of faith to get creative and think, how can you help this effort? Because there is a wealth of folks in our community that can help through their um, communities of faith. So thank you. Thank you for asking that question. Thank you for your answer. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Sign that commitment form. It's sitting outside at the registration table. I will. <laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Daylin. I'm actually a sophomore at Liberty here. Um, to jump on like the education bandwagon, like bandwagon, I volunteer at Lincoln Elementary where my mom is a second grade teacher. And I would definitely vouch for, a lot of them don't know how to read. Um, there's a lot of disciplinary um, issues. So just to kind of like vouch for that, people need to understand. Um, the obvious question is with like all the faith, like talk, does Liberty know about poverty and progress? Cause we have tons of people who could probably help. And I'm sure Liberty would jump at this opportunity. The short answer is yes. Um, okay. I know that uh, Jonathan Falwell has been in, in some discussions. I talked to the LU Serve group a couple of weeks ago, and there's several facets of, of uh, the campus life that are aware of from Poverty Progress and have committed some time to, uh, to helping with that effort. So if you can help spread it, that would be yeah, wonderful because I know you know, Liberty, Liberty has grown exponentially in the last few years, mm -hmm. and the group that I, I talked to was probably, um, I don't know, uh, 30, 30 children, and, uh, children, I'm getting old, right? <laughs> um, 30, 30 students and also faculty and staff. So that's a very small representation, but uh, on a whole, the administration as well as the student body and staff and faculty are aware of this, this entire city movement and supportive of it. Awesome, good. Uh, last question is, I can't remember your name, but the woman who talked about the legal system. Um, quick question with like, you said like, it says on here, assisting inmates with reentry. Is, when I think of that, I'm thinking of like full grown males and females and like getting out of jail and whatnot. What about like adolescents in detention centers and possibly group homes? I know we're trying to get rid of group homes right now, but like, are we gonna focus on them at all? because that's a huge need, because I'm a social work major, so I totally get this. You know, I'm sorry, I could not hear. Could the, you the question she's asking, reason? Jane, is, um, and we talked about re-entry for adults. Right. What about the juvenile population that may be in detention centers? Yes, we're definitely looking into that. We're okay. gonna meet with the, um, the head of the juvenile detention center now and look at that. Awesome. That's everything. Thank you. Take a couple more questions. Last one. Last, last three questions right here on the board, on deck. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Douglas Tom. To the young woman who just uh, spoke, uh, just call the Boys and Girls Club and talk to Mark Sheehan. 
there's a young woman who works after, uh, who works with the kids after school, and I believe she's a Liberty student, and she's great. So, obviously, someone at Liberty must know. Um, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, obviously, everyone who is here is wonderful. Um, but I think it's indicative that we have what a fifth as many as we had back in May. I think that. So I. It occurs to me that there's a group of, uh, of society that's sort of left out of the discussion. Someone touched on it. It's our non-impoverished youth, our kids who are in high school and college. I have two kids in college, <coughs> therefore I know a lot of kids who are in college. And so many of them say they would like to go into social work or mental health or special needs. But they'll follow that up with, but there's no money in it. There are no jobs, so I'll be a lawyer. So I'll get into venture capital. So I'll, I'll, I'll be a hedge fund manager. I just think there's something very sad about that. I think people do leave Lynchburg, but I think a lot of these kids would stay here. Um, but there really isn't any work. I advocate a, a, a dual currency monetary system. You know, so you got a dollar for your car and your house, and you got a dollar for health care and education. I don't think that's going to happen. But if everybody in here mentors, you know, one person, and I know how hard that is. I've, I've picked one girl at the Boys and Girls Club. If I can get her to stop saying I don't got, <laughs> I'll consider myself a successful man. I've given up on reforming health care. Um, but w the, the young people are filled with empathy, but they're really frustrated. Fifty percent of our kids in college are maybe not addicted to drugs, but they're taking, you know, prescription drugs, because they're so stressed out about the future. So we somehow have to incorporate into the education system uh, you know, something for our youth so that they can become the people to, to do these jobs so we don't have to volunteer to do all of it. Anyway, but you're all great. And, and, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last two questions, please. Thank you. Hello. My name is Michelin Hall. And before I ask my question, I don't mean to preach to the choir, but it's about to get very real, very, very real. So my question is what specific job training or skills, things are you providing for adults that are upwards of 30 years old that provide enough money to actually live like a living wage? The reason that I ask this is because my husband and I have two adults that can't seem to buy a job that will allow them to live on their own. I mean, it sounds funny, but if you actually, and I'm, not be, and I'm so serious, if you actually take what my husband and I make right now, if we were just our normal nuclear family, we would be, I guess, I guess regular middle class, probably on the lower end of middle class, just, yay, we pay all our bills on time, we're awesome. But as soon as you add two more people, two more adult people to that, if you looked at what we make, now we are honestly skirting above the poverty level because we're taking care of two adults. And I'm not saying that they're fully unemployed the whole time, but it's not enough for them to live. So I want to know, I'm not talking about somebody who's 18 where the world is their oyster and they get a second chance if they make a boo-boo. I'm talking about real people. I'm talking about people upwards of 30. What job skill training is available because training we understand is on a spectrum, okay? Knowing computer skills is one thing. But being able to work, let's say, at Pacific Life is another level of training. Am I right? Or can we all agree to that? So what, what is actually available that I could honestly take home to my household tonight and say, hey, great news, guys. I, I came here and I got these resources. Thank you, Michelle. Um, well, first thing, um, people have to understand they have to get more skills in the high demand job field areas. So that's IT, um, healthcare field, construction, manufacturing, advanced manufacturing. And if you go to the tables, CVCC Workforce Solutions, 
Region 2000 Workforce Center, even stop by the tech hire table. Get the information, tell them to go talk to the folks, sign up. They have to go, you're right, $7.25, $10 an hour are not survive jobs. So they have to go into listening to the professionals of where the jobs are. Um, I'm telling women, go into um, non-traditional women fields, become welders, electricians, plumbers. You know, we do all that anyway most of the time. So, you know, a lot of times. Um, but go and get the credentials and the training for it because it takes the higher skills, the credentials. There are programs out there that will, if you're taking care of feeding and housing them um, for a minute, um, let them take up to six months to go into these programs and get the skills necessary. Maybe not everyone wants to do that, but you, the reality is the high demand job fields are where the growth is from now until 2021, 22 and beyond. And so they may have to start making decisions about what is it that I want to do and how do I want to take care of myself. Entrepreneurship is great if they're in a field that they can go and have a passion. But if they want to go out and get, they need to go get the skills that people are hiring for, that they are paying the higher wages. And those folks out in that lobby know those. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And, and I, right before we have this last question, Michelin, I, I did, Dr. John Abel over at Randolph College just was parsing some information and he looked at the income of our, relative to Lynchburg, and that around forty thousand dollars is fine if you're a, you're, si you're single or married with no children. As soon as you have at least one child, it dips below what the standard is, and so that's what you're saying is completely relevant. And uh, I know I know Dr. Abel is going to be putting that information out in some of his presentations pretty soon too. Thank you again. Hi, my name is Evan Smith. I have a concern. I would say for the perspective uh, expressed from workforce development, uh, it's my understanding, my belief that people in poverty uh, do not arrive in poverty from uh, a dumb mistake that they made in their 19s and 20s. They, they get there because they were born in it. Uh, their parents are probably in poverty. Their grandparents are probably in poverty. If they have children, their, their children will, will probably be in poverty. And I think promoting a narrative that people don't want to work or uh, you know, something like that. I just don't think that's a helpful narrative to construct around poverty. As far as I know and what I believe, people in poverty are very willing and wanting to work. They need opportunities that pay them what they need to live. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, and I think you know, from what you said, uh, you know, skill training and that sort of thing, I guess, is a positive move in the right direction. But the business community, I think, should also acknowledge the factors that people face uh, that are in poverty. Not everyone's going to speak the same way, not everyone's going to interview well, but if they can do the job, that should be what should take priority. Um, and as well, uh, there's another point I think I'm missing right now, but um, I, I don't get a sense right now from the workforce development and from businesses that there's going to be an acknowledgement of these barriers. Um, right now, I've been going to the transportation meetings. And there are individuals there who, you know, the bus system is not what they need. If you cannot get to your job on time, that is not a choice. That is because the system is not there for you to get to your job on time. So if the business will not acknowledge that, then that's not, that's the business's fault, not the individual's fault. And poverty is not a choice, and we should be able to acknowledge that and create a narrative so that we put responsibility where uh, people are in power and not just on the individuals who are doing the best that they can to live every day. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a couple things. One, uh, your last point was spot on, but I think every one of us here, up here mentioned it. Not one of these focus groups stands in isolation because if you can't get to work, you're not going to be able to hold down a job. If you can't get childcare. I worked at a place where we work 24-7. Even if you can find daycare, eight to five, what do you do on third shift when you're forced to work on Christmas? Uh, so there's going to have to be a lot of cross-pollinization, and it's not going to be easy. And if I inferred that there's, you know, a large percentage of our workforce doesn't want to work, that's not what I'm talking about. But I think in any community, there are those people that are happy just 
doing what they're doing. But we have so many people that really do want to work and want to better themselves. And that's going to be our focus, is getting those people that really want the help, are willing to do what's necessary on their end, couple it with what we're trying to do up here collectively, and we'll be successful. Are we going to get everybody? Hell no. It's not possible. You know, we're just trying to get the needle moving in the right direction. You know, a lot of the ideas that come up, you know, we're trying to boil the ocean. We've got to take this elephant and eat it one bite at a time. And we're not going to get it right out of the gate 100%. So, you know, again, if I ticked anybody off by saying there's people out there that don't want to work, sorry, but there are. I've okay. seen them. Okay, we're going we're gonna to move on and um, just want all of you all to know I thank you from the bottom of my heart that you've come out tonight. You can see why we've picked these barriers. You've told us those are the right barriers. We've picked the right ones. And you know, we, City Council, decided to work with 50 individuals a year who are ready. Some may not be ready at this point, but that doesn't mean that they won't be ready in the future. So we're open. We're open to anyone who wants, you know, another, a hand up or some more information. Please, please tell folks to contact, in, in our city, it's John Hughes. And in the future, we're hoping that we will collectively have um, a website, a portal. We don't know yet. We're doing this as we move along. So there will be help out there and we want folks to know that and that the city cares and loves every individual that's the message i want you to leave with tonight and i want you all if you've not made the commitment to commit to this initiative tonight to sign the letter that's out there on that registration table that says okay i'm in for this and I'm going to work with this committee, or I can give this particular resource because I have this that I can give to this initiative. All, all is welcome. So in the months to come, these groups will continue to meet, and they're going to create plans that will take us from goals, that means talking and goals, to action. City Council will be discussing this information at our November 7th retreat. I encourage all of you, all of you, and I know many have gone home, to continue to work to make a difference in our community, to help those 30% 30 30 of children who are of that quarter percent living in poverty. We heard that many of them need many skills. So step up, be a mentor, be an encourager in our community to them. You know, I have such great faith that we're on the right track here. Have have we come to the end of this journey? No, no, we have just started this journey and we need you all to come alongside us and work with us and make it happen so that one day that we can say this is a community that is thriving for every citizen. You know what? I always like Mother Teresa because she used to quote, and I'm gonna say it tonight, I alone cannot change the world. Not you, not me, none of us can change the world. But guess what? We can cast a stone across the waters to create many ripples. I believe we have cast some stones tonight across the water, not at one another. And I'm excited to see how it will ripple throughout this community. So join, join the ripple and be part of our solution here. Again, don't forget to stop by that re the resource tables out there. Leave your completed uh, form if you want to be one of those ripples in our community. Um, sign on, make a commitment, pass the word on. If you're a house of faith, we need our faith community to come on board. So thank you, and may God bless this community, and may God bless you. Good night. <laughs>